Well, welcome everybody to the start of our fall uh, 2020 um, CC Colloquium. Um, still feels to me like a Tuesday in April, but here we are. It's uh, late August and the semester has started and we have a lineup for you for this semester that I hope, uh, hope you've had a chance to take a look at. I hope you find it pretty exciting. Um, if you don't, please let us know because we're going to start putting together the spring slate pretty soon and we're always happy to get feedback. Um, uh, a quick program note, a couple program notes. So one is uh, people have asked about recording. So we are recording every one of these and we hope to make them publicly available via the CC website with permission of the speakers uh, as the semester goes. Um, Jim, I haven't asked you for permission yet. I'll, I'll ask you later if you're willing to share this with, with folks afterwards. Um, okay. One other, <laughs> I, you don't have to answer right now. I don't want to put you on the yeah. spot. Well. Um, we can see how it goes and then you can decide. <laughs> um, uh, one other program note is those of you who are taking colloquium for a class, uh, Professor Busick has asked if you, if you would please stay on uh, afterwards for a few minutes. Uh, he'll then come on and give you some instructions and guidance for how the class is going to go and uh, also um, take your questions and I'll, I'll stick around to moderate that, uh, that back and forth. Um, so with that, I'm happy to welcome you to fall 2020 and turn this over to, to Minuarwa to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Ariel. Um, thanks very much, everybody, for being here for the for the first uh, of our colloquia this semester. Um, and it's my um, honor and real pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Jim Tabrizi. Um, Jim actually joined Arizona State University in uh, 1985 as assistant professor in the then Department of Geology. And, uh, you know, he retired just this past spring. Uh, and so he's had a really illustrious history here with us uh, at ASU for uh, the last 35 years. And uh, just, you know, incredible uh, leadership that he has, uh, uh, you know, basically as part of his field, he was a considered world expert and leader in the field of uh, physical and chemical behavior of earth materials at high pressures including at shock pressures. Um, he's used a, a variety of methodologies in his research, including experimentation, physical experimentation, equations of state, uh, and electrical imaging for his investigations. Um, and uh, he's also made some very important contributions locally to understanding Arizona aquifers using uh, gravity and other geophysical means. Um, Jim's actually had a, a real leadership role in his and the science community in the area that he has um, that he has led, uh, including service on committees at the national international levels, uh, most notably for the Compress Consortium. So that's the Consortium for Materials and Property Research in the Earth Science, and it's a, you know significant community effort. And so he led that uh, for many years. And and then he's also, of course, been uh, uh, an incredible educator, um, teacher, and mentor uh, during his career at ASU. Many of his former students have gone on to very successful careers as uh, educators and, and, and as consultants and in national laboratory, laboratories as well. Um, one of the really uh, you know, important roles that uh, Jim has had has been to uh, lead our school and also the predecessor departments um, over the course of uh, the many years that he's been here. And his, um, you know, he's shown a steady leadership and steady guidance of, of our school at many critical junctures. Um, he was actually the associate director, um, I'm sorry, the associate chair of the Department of Geological Sciences, then Department of Geological Sciences from around 2000 to 2003 and then chair of the Department of Geological Sciences from 2003 to 2006, and uh, really involved quite, uh, um, uh, quite deeply in the inception of our school uh, in 2006. And he served at that time as interim uh, associate director of the School of Earth and, the newly established School of Earth and Space Exploration. And then he was um, associate director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration uh, a couple of times in 2006 to 2007, and then 2012 to 2013, and then also interim director of the school uh, in 2013 to 2014, which is um, when Lindy came on board as director in 2014. And then he was also deputy director most recently in 2017 for our school. 
So he's had, you know, many um, sort of helped us through many transitions actually, and uh, uh, been a great leader and um, an incredible colleague as well. So Jim, it's a real pleasure to, to welcome you today. And we're really fortunate to have you present this colloquium where you'll be um, telling us about the history and heritage of our school. So uh, welcome, Jim. Thank you very much, Minnie, for that nice uh, introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Um, so what I want to talk about today is some of the early history and, and events and people, really, that led to the forming of, of CC. But I'm going to talk, be talking mostly about times before CC actually existed. Not entirely, but some. Uh, the first slide here just shows some of the buildings that CC has, is in and has been in. Um, Discovery, Hall, Discovery Hall down here was built in 1948. It's where the nascent geology department was housed in the late 50s. Um, after that, geology moved into PSF, um, which was built in like 1969. Um, Certain of our projects are based in the Goldwater, in the Moore Building, the Mars exploration uh, projects, uh, Lunar uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera, Mark Robinson's over here in the interdisciplinary A. And then finally in 2013, ISTB4 was completed and, and parts of the department moved in. But in fact, aside from Discovery Hall, every one of these other buildings is occupied with uh, CC people, CC functions, CC research and teaching uh, projects. All right, that was the wrong direction. Okay, just, just a little bit about me again. Uh, I came to ASU in 19, January of 1986, uh, moved through the ranks. My research is in mineral physics, Electrical conductivity, diffusion, and transport. High pressure has been a recurring theme through that work. Uh, and my teaching activities, a lot of intro geology, mantle geophysics, and stuff. Uh, and I spent a number of years teaching hydrogeology, getting involved in the practical side of things and the uh, uh, courses that are valuable for students going into local consulting and local industry. Um, here's a picture of a uh, high pressure lab with uh, several uh, former students, Jeff Roberts, Wyatt Dufresne, Dan Toffelmeyer. Uh, here we are out in the Salt Riverbed doing some uh, environmental field geophysics, thumping in the base of, of the riverbed before Tempe Town Lake was filled up. And then to represent some of the administrative uh, work I've done, here's a picture I had an opportunity to get a picture with Bill Walton, famous NBA and college basketball star. So if you're a sports fan, which I am, this was kind of an interesting uh, uh, event afforded me. Anyway, so those are some of the things I've been doing. Uh, I want to say right off, I am not a historian. Uh, and the evolution of CC is a big idea and, a, and a, a long string of events and every one of us has some little fraction of it, some little part that we're more aware of than others. I'm going to be telling you about parts of which I am aware, um, but there are many stories within the development of CC and what I'm presenting is, is only a part of it, only a fraction representing what I'm comfortable knowing about. Uh, okay, so a sh the short history of CC is that in 2002, Michael Croak becomes president of ASU. In 2006, Kip Hodges arrives as founding director of CC, followed by Lindy and Minnie. Uh, and there we go, we're entering our 15th year here. And so that's the short story. It's a good story. Uh, but how was it that CC became fertile ground for Michael Crow to say, I'm going to invest, I'm going to help this unit, this grouping of units, geosciences and astrophysics, 
to become a bigger, stronger, better unit. Um, what caused him to be willing to do that? And that's what I want to talk about, the heritage of geoscience and astrophysics collaboration long before 2002 that provided a strong foundation for the innovation that is CC now. Okay. Just again, to go back to Michael Crow, the design imperatives of the new American University in 2002. Uh, just so you know, the uh, ASU website that promote that, that you find these um, puts them all in all caps. <laughs> so I didn't make these all caps. These are from Michael Crow directly, but leveraging place, society, knowledge and entrepreneurial, in other words, highly active research programs, use inspired research, cultural and intellectual diversity. Um, I don't know what we're gonna do, inter, multi, trans, post disciplinarity. I'm not sure what our next variation on the disciplinarity theme will be, but we'll, it will come, I'm sure. But these are the things, Michael Crow, social embeddedness, global engagement. These are the, the talking points, the design imperatives that Michael Crow wanted to see in 2002, still wants to see in AS activities and that CC had to prove that we were to him, that we were ready, that we could do this, that we were, the, we were one of the very first groups that he chose, that he invested in to make us move forward. All right, I wanna take it way far back just cause it's kind of fun to think about once in a while. In 1885, Arizona State became, was commissioned by the uh, Arizona State legislature as, legislature as the Territorial Normal School at Tempe. Territorial, it was before it became a state. Um, normal School is a teacher's college, so it was a teacher's school. Uh, Old Main here built in 19, 1898. Old Main today, you see they restored it. They had sort of done some terrible things to these balconies, but they, in the, uh, around 2010, they had, they rebuilt this, these landings to be more faithful to the original. But back in 1885, the competition between Tucson, Phoenix, and Prescott, there was intense competition for the state resources. And in this legislature, legislatural session of 1885, Tucson got the University of Arizona and the mental health hospital. Prescott was the territorial capital and ASU got Tempe Normal School or the Territorial Normal School. Um, the real prize among these things was the mental health hospital that had the biggest budget that had got, was gonna get the most money from the legislature and Tucson fought very hard to be sure that they got the mental health hospital. So the tradition of competition between Tempe and Phoenix and Tucson is uh, uh, of long standing, and uh, Tucson got the mental health hospital back in 1885. Fast forward about 60 years, uh, 1958 statewide public referendum. Arizona, which at that time had advanced through several name changes, Arizona State Teachers College, Arizona State College, but in 1958, a public referendum, it became Arizona State University. Uh, again, intense. So here, a, a new name, a true name, that was one of their catchphrases for that particular election. Here's a picture of Mill, a picture of Mill Avenue back in those days. I'm not sure where that is, but that's Mill Avenue. Some more uh, comics, vote yes on 200. About 1,500 out of the 10,000 students uh, that were enrolled at the time came out to get out the vote, to canvas people, to knock on doors, to get people to vote for Tucson, built to name ASU, uh, was being blocked by folks from Tucson, but in a public referendum, by that point in time, Phoenix had the larger population and the referendum passed and ASU became a university. Um, even before that, it was recognized by a number of people that 
ASU was going to grow, it was going to be likely become a university. And if it was going to do that, it had to build its research engine, it had to build its research enterprise. Grady Gamage, a longtime president of ASU from 1933 to 59, uh, is memorialized in the uh, Gamage Auditorium and in any, any number of other things around campus. And his son, Grady Gamage Jr., is also a key player in the growth of ASU even today. Homer Durham came president in the 60s and also pushed forward this research agenda. But kind of an unsung hero in all of this is a guy named George Boyd, who was uh, uh, a leader, a coordinator of research in the 50s and 60s. And he was responsible for beginning to grow that research enterprise in the, in the mid 1950s. He was a forward thinking guy. He tried to develop a medical school. Again, an idea which still has not fully taken root here in, in ASU uh, because of competition with other schools. Um, he promoted solar energy. Uh, so he, he recognized some themes that would be important in the future that ASU should get in on and be part of. And one thing that he did, a fellow, a person that he knew and was friends with, he interacted with Harvey Nininger, who is the father of modern uh, meteoritics. Harvey Nininger was a self-taught, self-financed meteor, uh, meteorite scientist. He made more than half of all the meteorite recoveries, discoveries in the world during his time period of the 30s through about 1960. He founded the American Meteorite Museum at Meteor City. And he, again, was uh, uh, looking for meteorites as a, as a place to stand where he talked to educate people about science and while he looked for an organized program of meteorite research. So he was the early father of modern meteoritics. And uh, what's next? Yes. So at some point in the late 50s, he had a collection of maybe 900 meteors, meteorites. Um, and he sold part of it to the British Museum, a small fraction, 15% of them, 120 meteorites or so. Uh, this brought a uh, flurry of activity on the part of ASU, on the part of George Boyd, who recognized that this was a, not only a, a, a major international research collection, but, but something of particular relevance to the state of Arizona. And it was important to try and keep it in Arizona. So uh, George Boyd poised, pushed for this. He uh, got Grady Gamage to, to buy in. They got some NSF uh, funding, ASU Foundation funding. Uh, Herbert G. Fails, who I don't have a picture of, but I do have a picture of his son here, um, was a VP of International Nickel and was also kind of a pilot and adventurer. Uh, but Herbert Fails was a key person in the, in the concluding the deal to form uh, to bring this meteorite collection to ASU. And one thing you might notice in this slide, something missing from this slide, uh, is the Department of Geology. At that point of, in time, in the, in the late 1950s, earliest 1960s, uh, Paul Miller was the founding chair of the Department of Geology. Uh, but he was focused on teaching and uh, less on research. And he was reluctant to invest in the Meteorite Center. And so Clyde Crowley, chair of chemistry, uh, was lead PI on the grant that, that brought in the money to buy roughly 700 meteorites from uh, Nininger. Um, and uh, was what is why much of the Meteorite Center's early history is is centered in the Department of Chemistry. It's not the only time we will see this kind of theme. Once we had the meteorite collection uh, secured, it needed a director and Carlton Moore, a, P, a recent Caltech graduate teaching out at Wesleyan College in uh, Connecticut, uh, 
was recruited as the founding director of the Center for Meteorite Studies. He was director for 42 years. Um, and he really made use of, he really brought the Meteorite Center forward. He uh, organized the collection. He participated, he was uh, uh, studying the Apollo samples. They actually, he was part of the uh, Mars or the Lunar uh, receiving laboratory in Houston as the samples came back. There's Carlton. Uh, um, Chuck Lewis, who was a, a curator for many years at ASU, and Everett Gibson, who was a geochemist of some note as well. And there's Carlton today. So Carlton, we owe a lot to him. He, he, he developed the Meteorite Center and he brought it forward over 40 years as a major internationally known research place. The Meteorite Center also brought other great people to ASU. Peter Busick came to ASU in 1963. This has been noted before during the Colloquium Center, Colloquium Series. Uh, Peter is in his 57th year as a regular faculty member uh, at ASU and he's still going strong. It's an incredible uh, longevity thing, but incredible contributions to ASU. And again, he was joint chemistry. I should go back. When Carlton came in, I said uh, that the chemistry department was the lead PI. But when Carlton came, he was a, a geochemist, but he was a geochemist. So he insisted that he come in with joint professorship in geology and chemistry thereby starting a tradition of collaboration and joint appointments with the chemistry. Peter came in and was also joint chemistry and geology. Jack Larimer came in in the late 60s. Ron Greeley came in 1977. We'll be talking a lot more about Ron. Lori Leshen became director in 2003 to 2005. And then Minnie came in as director 2006 to 2019. So a long list of illustrious people associated with the Center for Meteorite Studies uh, at ASU. Okay, after that was sort of settled and going on, ASU uh, brought in Troy Payway as chair of the Department of Geology, 1965 to 1976. Troy's job, Troy's mandate was to change the culture of department. It was an interesting appointment because Troy was a permafrost, Arctic geomorphology, icy landscapes kind of geologist. Uh, you might wonder coming to the desert uh, is a little out from a guy. Here's a picture of Troy in Tibet. Um, but he dove in and uh, embraced the desert and uh, raised the national research profile of the department, brought in others who would raise the profile of the department. There were some battles and some folks left when he, because he was pushing for this research, developed the graduate program. I believe the first PhD was around 1974. And he also was heavily engaged in community and regional environmental geology, structure, tectonics kinds of activity. So Troy, here's a picture of him in the 60s. Here he was in the uh, 80, he passed away uh, in about 1999, I think. Again, raised profile of geology. There's a plaque commemorating him in the uh, foyer of the PSF building. Again, classic map of groundwater levels leading to land subsidence fissures around the Phoenix area. These kinds of local classical uh, geology of central Arizona field trips, co-authored with Don Burt, who came in the department about mid-1975. And Troy led geology field trips and, uh, and the members of the community field trips down the Colorado River. Troy would bring a cutout of uh, John Wesley Powell that when we were down at the deepest, bottomest part of the canyon, he would bring out John Wesley Powell and we would sit and commune with John Wesley Powell. So there I am in 1988 communing with Troy communing with John Wesley Powell in the uh, bottom of the Grand Canyon. Okay, what else was going on in those days? In 1961, a 
person named Leroy Eyring became chair of chemistry. Leroy Eyring was part of the famous Eyring family, a couple of three generations of, uh, of chemists. His older brother, Henry Eyring, was uh, the founder, the developer of transition state theory. Uh, if you know, remember that from your intro chemistry, chemical kinetics kinds of uh, things. He was a pioneer. He himself was a solid state chemist, studied rare earth oxides. He founded the ASU Center for Solid State Science, which in various forms exists to this day, later became the Eyring Material Center. But a key thing that, that Eyring did was recognize that geochemistry could be considered to be a branch of solid state chemistry. He hired in Alexandra Navrosky and John Holloway in the years around 1969 and 70. Both later became joint professors in geology and chemistry, again, continuing that collaborative, that joint professorship kind of tradition. Uh, Holloway and uh, Navrotsky established a very strong uh, tradition of interdisciplinary experimental geochemistry and high pressure research that lasts to this day. Uh, the Depths of the Earth Lab that Holloway founded still exists with Kurt Leinweber and Kurt Rogensack uh, running it. The Multiple Anvil High Pressure Lab is sort of in that same tradition. Kurt Leinweber and Tom Sharp run that with a little uh, interference from me on occasion. Christy Till, Experimental Petrology and Igneous Processes Center, again, continues this same trend. The Diamond Anvil Cell Lab, Dan Shim, and uh, uh, again, continues this this tradition of experimental high pressure studies. And just in 2019, Alex Navrotsky, after being away from ASU for about 20 years, Alex was at ASU from 1969 to about 1985. She left ASU, went to Princeton, went to UC Davis, came back to ASU in 2019 to establish the Navrotsky Eyring Center for Materials of the Universe, a collaboration between School of Molecular Sciences and Chemistry, the School of uh, Energy, Materials, and Transport, and CC. So it's a uh, multi, again, a multi-divisional uh, collaboration between all these units. It's great to have Alex back. So here are, so Holloway and Navrotsky, there's John one, using one of his uh, patented small presses. Uh, there's Alex having some fun in the lab. Uh, again, one thing about some of the outstanding leaders and people who've shaped our, our uh, uh, unit is that they bring in key people to ASU. Rick Hervig came to ASU in about 1981 uh, as a postdoc with Alex, became the SIMS operator, became full faculty in 2004 and a key person without whom CC would not exist in its present form is Chris Skiba, our manager of facilities. He came to ASU in the early 1980s, again to work with Alex Navrotsky, uh, and then moved over to work with some of us uh, in geosciences and then to CC. Uh, again, Chris has been an enormous strength of Geology in the first place, CC in the in the in the recent years as we develop and build facilities. Well, part of the reasons ASU has become as a known as a place uh, where we can build facilities. And then here's just some some lab pictures: Christie's lab, Dan Shim's Diamond Cell Lab, Kurt Line and Weber in the Multi Anvil Lab, and the founding a a picture of the founders of the. Center for Materials of the Universe, showing uh, Dan and myself and Tom and uh, Everett Schock, Steve Desch, Hillary, all part of the development and the uh, uh, interest in this Materials of the Universe Center. Additionally, additionally instigated by Leroy Eyring is the Arizona strength in high resolution microscopy. Uh, Leroy Eyring was seeking, recognized that electron microscopy was going to become a powerful new field in the late 1960s. It was just maturing. Uh, he recruited, he hired in a man named John M. Cowley, who was one of the world's uh, outstanding 
microscopist at the time. Uh, and he developed, Cowley developed with, with the uh, help of Michael O'Keefe in chemistry, with the help of Peter Busick in geology and chemistry. Uh, the HREM is one of the most internationally recognized ASU research efforts. Starting back in the, in the early 70s, it's again one of the institutions that put ASU on the map and uh, Peter Busick was one of the leading users in geoscience recognizing that this, these kinds of tools would be valuable for looking at earth materials and, uh, and proceeded to do so over many, many successful years. Um, again, students, postdocs of Peter now on faculty at SU, Tom Sharp got his PhD working with uh, Peter Busick, now a professor in CC. Lawrence Garvey, research professor in the Center for Meteorite Studies, was a postdoc with Peter Busick. So again, many of the leaders of these early efforts have been, have brought in other outstanding researchers, outstanding teachers to uh, be part of uh, CC part of ASU. Again, we're still in the Department of Geology days, but it's coming. I just want to spend a slide talking about Bob Dietz. Bob Dietz was at ASU from 1977 to 1995. He was one of the founding fathers, pioneers of plate tectonics. So here at ASU, we have a direct connection with ori origins of plate tectonics in the, in the early and mid late 1960s. Bob coined the phrase seafloor spreading. There was controversy for many years over whether Bob or Harry Hess had coined the term first, but, but sort of uh, belatedly, Bob got credit for uh, coining the phrase. In addition, he studied impact sites all over the world. He ran, traveled the world, a lot of field work, identifying shatter cones and other evidence of, of impact sites. He loved to debate creationism, so he wrote a comic book essentially uh, bashing creationism and he and he he loved to debate so they had he, he developed many public debates uh, arguing with creationists it's not clear anybody on one side convinced anybody on the other side through these debates but they were good spectacle good fun good publicity and Bob would say I never met a rock I didn't like which is a pretty good statement for a man who who uh, uh, was a geophysicist essentially uh, studying the interior of the earth. Uh, just to say that the geophysics program at, at ASU now with Tom Sharp, Ed Garnero, Dan Shim, myself, Ming Ming Lee and Joe O'Rourke, uh, owe a lot to Bob for keeping it going and for providing a tradition for uh, what we're doing in uh, in geophysics. So Ron Greeley came to ASU in 1977. Carlton recruited him. Uh, Ron was an incredibly prolific, incredibly effective uh, uh, teacher and researcher. Uh, he was involved in the Apollo program to the moon, Mars, Mars and Venus, Magellan to Venus, Galileo, satellites of Jupiter, Callisto, Ganymede, uh, Mars exploration rovers, almost no planetary exploration project during these years went on without Ron being a significant uh, part of that work. Uh, again, he was a planetary geologist. He firmly believed in field geology as a foundation for mapping of other planets, uh, volcanology, aeolian processes. Uh, the Ron Greeley Center for Planetary Studies at ASU is named after him. He met for many years managed uh, the Space Photography Lab, which then morphed into the Greeley Center. Uh, he ran a wind tunnel at Ames. He studied impact crater, cratering uh, through a shockwave gun at Ames. Uh, so he left this huge legacy of planetary mission involvement at ASU. This is a major contribution and a major thing. He was part of Europa Clipper when he passed away in 2011, which is still under development. Again, Ron brought key people to ASU. John Fink, planetary volcanologist, came, came to be a, as a postdoc with Ron Greeley, became a faculty member in geology. A few years later, 10 years after that, became department chair. 
and he became the vice president for research at ASU. So this is a key point that we'll come back to. Uh, Phil Christensen, 1981, the president came to, came to be a postdoc with Ron, 1986 became faculty member. And again, Mars Remote Sensing and Instrumentation, we'll talk some more about this. And Dave Williams, presently the director of the Greeley Center, research professor, uh, also came as a postdoc in Ron's group. So again, outstanding leadership, outstanding uh, tradition of passing on to the next generations uh, the mandate for, for planetary missions. So Phil Christensen, again, came as a postdoc in 1981. In 1986, uh, became a faculty member. And what precipitated his becoming a faculty member was uh, successfully uh, writing a grant for a Mars Global Surveyor Thermal Emission Spectroscopy System instrument to be carried on the Mars Global Surveyor uh, spacecraft uh, to Mars, and he was awarded this grant in 1986. That put ASU on the path of major planetary instrument development. Ron Greeley was a mapper, studied the images, studied the surface of planets, but Phil became an instrument maker, an instrument development uh, uh, expert. Um, Phil tells the story that in, uh, in 1986, when he was awarded this grant, he went and talked to uh, the relevant dean. The dean said, you have no idea how hard you're making my life. We don't have the capacity at ASU to supervise, to manage such a project. You know, why did you do this? Um, again, that dean uh, the, uh, it didn't last all that long. Phil found a way to work within ASU to develop the lab, to develop the facilities in the Moore building. But the, 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 the showing the damage that bad administrators can do, um, there was another instrument awarded on that same Marge Global Surveyor project, a camera, uh, a professor named Mike Malin, some of us may remember, uh, was also awarded a grant to be, to be on that mission. And again, ASU responded rather weakly with the space and the, and the uh, uh, support needed. And so Mike left. So Mike, so we could have had two instruments starting as far back as 1986, uh, but we didn't. Well, we did have one and it's been fabulous uh, with Phil Christensen. Um, again, ever since Phil has, has uh, had many, many infrared emission kind of uh, missions to Mars, to the, astro to the asteroid Bennu. He just launched on the uh, Emirates El Am Al Amir mission just recently. More instruments under development. Um, um, something else I want to say here, but I can't think of it. Engineering collaborations are certainly uh, where, yeah, sought engineering collaborations. And this, this leads us, you can see the, the things lining up for CC. Uh, Phil not only wanted to build, he wanted to design and actually have build at ASU these, uh, these uh, instruments. And Phil also brought key people to, to ASU. Steve Ruff, research professor, started out as a, as a student in Phil's group and now Steve is a uh, uh, important member of our CC faculty. Uh, and CC remains busy in space. So along con in, in the general sense of planetary science, we have the uh, Psyche mission to a metallic asteroid, the interplanetary planetary initiative uh, uh, that Lindy runs, Luna H map of Craig, Craig Hardgrove, the Phoenix uh, small sat mission that, that Bowman just uh, led, Jim Bell came, joined us, uh, Mars Science Laboratory, the uh, New Space uh, Project, and Mark Robinson, the LROC uh, Project Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera. All of these follow in the tradition of instrument build, builders and planetary missions that Carlton started, that Ron started, that Phil uh, started. 
What was going on in physics and astronomy? Well, it, it was called physics astronomy for many years, but in 1973, Sumner Starfield became a uh, uh, professor at ASU, computational astrophysics, stellar explosions observing. A couple years later, Per Anastad came, uh, infrared astronomy, looking at interstellar matter. Susan Wyckoff uh, came in 1979, visible and infrared physics and astronomy. Education, she was the PI of a major teaching grant, Arizona Collaborative for the Excellent in the Preparation of Teachers in the mid 1990s. Uh, Ann Cowley, binary stars, black holes, uh, editor of some major astrophysical journals. These are the sort of the founding four of the astronomy aspects of the physics and astronomy department. They increased astronomy sections from just a few up to as many as 24 sections, developed the graduate program in astrophysics and, and uh, banded together to form a strong unit within a much larger physics department. After them came another series of, of astronomers, David Burstein, uh, uh, Roger Windhorst, the Regents Professor of Cosmology, Instrumentation, much activity on Hubble, we'll talk about that. Jeff Hester came in 1991, star formation and early solar system, uh, astronomy education, another strong astronomy educator. Paul Scohan came as a post, whoops, let me back up. Paul Scohan came as a, as, a, as a postdoc, became a research professor some years later. Again, astronom astronomical instrumentation, mission development, uh, education. And John Morris came in 1988 for a few years, dark matter and mission development. Key in the, in the growth and development of the astrophysics side of CC were the next series of hires, Steve Desch, Sangeeta Malhotra, and James Rhodes. These are the first astrophysicists hired directly into CC when CC existed, when CC began to exist. Uh, Steve came in just before CC actually uh, existed. This had to be a great leap of faith on Steve's part to come to ASU when we were talking about saying, oh yeah, this thing is gonna happen. This is gonna be great. Uh, Steve came and thrived and made it great. Star, form, star and planet modeling, a uh, strong interface between meteoritics and planetary science. This is one of the real strengths and glue of CC, this war, interaction between astronomy and uh, meteoritics and planetary science. Uh, PA, PI of a major multi-institutional grant to study geochemical cycles on exoplanets. Sangeeta and James came in 2006 studied the age of reionization, involved in a number of, Gallic, of uh, major planetary missions. Uh, they went back to Goddard to become lead scientists on the w First mission that will be launching in mid to late 2020s. But again, all of these, this group of people came kind of on spec, kind of trusting, believing, hoping that CC would, uh, uh, be a good environment for them, CC would grow and thrive and that they could be developing astrophysics program within the CC umbrella. And they've all been very successful doing that. Some of the activities uh, going on in those, those years, the, the classic Pillars of Creation image was created by Jeff Hester and Paul Scohan, the uh, infrared, uh, ultraviolet image of the Eagle Nebula showing uh, regions of star formation in the uh, constellation around Ursa Major, I believe. Uh, this is one of the top 10 Hubble images ever produced. Uh, in recent years, folks have revisited that kind of image with higher and higher resolution with more and more Hubble time spent on it. But this first image by Jeff and with Paul Scullin, uh uh, really caught the public's eye, really caught the research community's eye, and was a major coup for ASU's astrophysics side. Uh, another major coup for 
Uh, ASU's astrophysics was the Hubble Deep Field image in 1995 uh, with uh, uh, Roger Windhorst being the one of the one of two teams that worked together to create this image. Again, this is a this is a long exposure deep field. This this entire image uh, is about a much much less than a one degree in uh, in space. Uh, showing us that no matter where you go, farther and farther out in the universe, there are still galaxies. Every one of these spots is a galaxy. Um, and uh, it opened a whole new uh, field of study, studying these deep field images and looking deeper and deeper into time, into space. Uh, this was updated with the ultra deep field image and the extreme deep field image in 2012. Again, that Roger is still uh, involved with. Just other, some other major collaborative efforts. I think my time is good. Um, the National Astrobiology Institute, the NAI, in 1998, Jack Farmer was attracted to ASU to become, to propose for the ASU node of the then uh, beginning National Astrobiology. Institute, exploring the living universe, the origin, evolution, and distribution of life in the solar system. This is a major multi-institute co collaborative research effort uh, and multi-institutions in terms of that ASU was one node of the uh, NAI, but it's an, an, a, a maturing of interactions between ASU and other institutions in major uh, research efforts. Uh, Again, following that, Ariel Anbar was PI of a major astrobiology grant, followed the elements. Steve Desch is PI now of the Nexus Project, Nexus for Exoplanet System Science. Not exact, not part of the uh, Astrobiology Institute, but, but a, uh, a uh, daughter of that, if you will, a follow, following pro project based on success in the earlier NAI instruments. Another example of collaborative efforts is the Keck Environmental Biogeochemistry Lab, which recently has been uh, renamed. Everett Schock, Everett Schock came to ASU in 2002 uh, to help write that proposal and become lab director. Uh, Ari Anbar came in 2004 and took, took over designing that lab. And again, these two are also examples of people who came in that time period, 2002 to 2004, when CC was very much under discussion, but wasn't quite a proven commodity at all, hadn't been officially uh, instituted. Many came in 2006 and became part of this uh, laboratory effort. Again, collaborative efforts across departments, across uh, techniques, uh, people coming to ASU uh, to participate in CC as it's, even as it's being formed before it actually exists. Just want a couple of quick slides on science education and science education research. Again, the physics department has, a, has had a long history of science uh, teaching, science education research, science education activities. Sue Wyckoff was in 1979, became PI of collaborative for the excellence in the preparation of teachers in the 1980s. Um, other physics professors, uh, Dave Hestonese, Howard Voss, established national reputations in terms of science teaching and physics teaching. So, so physics has been very strong in, uh, in teaching efforts. Roger Windhorst came in 1986, he, he has developed worked on 3D models of the heavens for sight impaired people, a very novel and, uh, and uh, interesting kind of project. Steve Reynolds came in 1991. Again, Steve is a tectonics and structural geologist, but he turned his, at least part of his research program over toward geoscience education research, active learning, visualization, eye tracking. Uh, Steve is a major force nationally in geoscience education. Uh, Jeff Hestel, Hester, 
Uh, again, Hubble, ultraviolet spectroscopy, but science visualization and motivation. He was a very uh, well-known textbook writer, but again, a strong education and, uh, and science visualization. And then Steve Semkin came in, 19, in 2003. Again, um, geoscience education research, place-based science education, coming in 2003 to join the still growing, the not yet existing School of Earth and Space Exploration. Uh, just some examples of community engagement, again, in geology, local, regional, environmental, tectonics kind of work. Troy Payway, Don Burt, Paul Knauf, Reynolds, Ramon Aerosmith, Ed Stump, Steve Simkin, all uh, have done over the years all kinds of uh, research and uh, regionally applicable community engaged uh, research. Colorado River Grand Canyon trips, a long tradition of those. Troy Payway led those for many years. Paul Canal is still leading trips down the Colorado River under under the CC banner, Ramon Aerosmith has led a number of trips down the Colorado. Uh, I've mentioned the ASEPT uh, Collaborative, again, a regional community effort. Astronomy Open Houses, student-led telescope viewing and planetaries, these have been going on for decades. Uh, sometimes they draw hundreds and hundreds of uh, enthusiasts to, uh, to the department both in geology, uh, both in, excuse me, physics and astronomy before CC and since CC, a uh, very strong student-led effort. Uh, the Mars programs have very strong student engagement, student imaging projects. Again, Phil and Ron uh, had all, uh, very, have still strong uh, programs in, uh, in uh, teacher education. Physics and astronomy has, has maintained over the years the MNS program, Master of Natural Science program, for teachers to earn master's degrees so they can progress on their salary scales, so they can develop new skills, new things to teach their students. Um, uh, CC has a similar kind of program, but physics has really used it, not, not with huge numbers of people, but a very strong and steady stream of uh, of uh, master's degrees for teachers. Um, and one last community engagement uh, comment, Earth and Space Science Day has been running from approximately 1998 to the present. It was built upon open houses run by Ron Greeley and NASA and some of the NASA funded planetary groups. They were encouraged, required even to have open houses uh, one year in there, the an organization called the uh, AGI, the American uh, Geoscience Institute, uh, got a National Earth Science Day commission. They went to the Arizona State Legislature, and the Arizona State Legislature um, commissioned an Earth Science Day in the state of Arizona, at which point the geology department uh, stepped up and brought in the entire geology department to build upon these open houses. Uh, it's one of the unique, no other department on campus does it, uh, uh, activities that the department participates in um, uh, from top to bottom and brings thousands of people for a weekend open house uh, every year. It's been going on for over 20 years now uh, with quite a lot of success. Again, unique to any department at ASU. Just a few comments about key individuals who are not with us anymore, but I mentioned John Fink, volcanologist, sustainability scientist, was a postdoc with Ron, became faculty, became department chair, and then leapt directly from department chair to ASU vice president of research. Um, during that time, he got to know Michael Crow. Michael Crow was um, director of the Columbia of the Earth Institute at Columbia University in New York, and ASU brought him in sort of regularly over a period of years as a consultant as to um, 
uh, provide us advice on how ASU overall might grow, uh, and also to uh, uh, when the presidency of ASU became interested, Michael Crow was already very familiar with ASU and and could be enticed to become president. Uh, John left us in 2007, became vice president of research at Portland State University. Uh, another key individual, Simon Peacock, metamorphic petrology, tectonics, uh, at ASU from 1985 to 2006, was chair for a period, became dean of natural sciences in CLAS, again, during that crucial time period, 2003 to 2006. So Simon was on the inside uh, working on our behalf through the administrative uh, hierarchy to support and uh, help uh, ASU uh, CC become into existence. Uh, and then Lori Leshen. Lori Leshen is a meteorite geochemist. She actually grew up in Tempe and got her Bachelor of Science in chemistry at ASU. Uh, she became a professor. She got her PhD at Caltech. She became a professor at ASU in 1998, director of the Center for Meteorite Studies in 2003. Uh, left ASU for a couple of other pre positions and now is president of Worcester Polytechnical Institute in 2014 to the present. Lori was a key idea person. She was like a meteor. She rocketed across our, our uh, experience here at ASU during these years and was a key individual in the development of, of CC. Uh, so this is essentially similar to what I just said before. John Fink, ASU Vice President of Research, got to know Michael Crow. Crow becomes president. In 2003, Crow challenges geology and astrophysics to develop an entirely new type of academic unit that blends geoscience, astrophysics, engineering, and community education and outreach. Uh, and CC is what came out of that. Uh, among the, among our, the faculty members, uh, who helped develop that, Ron Greeley, who was actually the first interim director of CC. Phil Christensen led the curriculum develop, Roger Windhorst, Jeff Hester, Lori Leshen, John Fink, Ramon, myself, and many others in the department matured and developed uh, the ideas that became CC. So to sort of reorganize the short history of CC, 2002, Michael Crow becomes president. He finds a strong heritage of interdisciplinarity, uh, geoscience and astrophysics, education and community engagement that encourages him to invest in creating CC. Kip Hodges arrived in his founding director in 2006. Again, Lindy and Minnie uh, followed as director. So CC is successfully entering its 15th year. Uh, and I just want to conclude with a, uh, a display here of our CC mission statement. This was developed by that committee early on. Kip Hodges tuned it and refined it to a great extent. Subsequent directors have tuned it a little bit, but this is the current one. Pathbreaking research on Earth, other planets, and space. We focus on the education of our undergraduate and graduate students. We reach out to the community and K-12 students and educators with our research and training, and we foster a positive, collaborative academic community. So these are these are the mission statement tenets of AS of CC. Uh, you can see how it developed over the years, and I believe this I'm done. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jim. That was. Uh... Quite a, quite a tour through a lot of people who uh, uh, many of us didn't know about and many of us knew, know about a little bit. Uh, now we really know what their importance was. And I, I just want to say personally, um, uh, you know, you were instrumental in recruiting me to CC. I don't know if you remember, but uh, you, I was going to hand it off to you as a recruitment case from Simon Peacock. And it was your job to kind of reel me in, which, which you did, I recall, quite distinctly hemming and hawing a little bit. And you telling me, well, no, I need a decision this month. It's like, you know, he's up or down. And uh, <laughs> I said, well, I better make up my mind. So, uh, so yeah. thank you for that. I, I'm, I'm very glad you, uh, you reeled me in there.
Actually, can I just also add that uh, Jim was critical in bringing uh, bringing me here as well. I kind of, you know, he was he was definitely the person that, uh, that I engaged with uh, pretty much, I guess, on on an almost daily basis for a time, uh, and it was really incredible. But I'm I'm very glad I did. Well, you guys. So it was. Go ahead, Jim. Those were the days. It was. It was. You guys. You guys came to CC on spec and uh, took a chance and helped make it what it is. It wasn't wasn't a big bet given who was here. <laughs> That's kind of the way I look at it. Um, we're a little over time, but but given all the interest here, if people have a question or two, you can put it in the in the Q and A, and maybe we'll we'll do one or two quick questions. Um, but then we need to wrap it up so that uh, the colloquium class can have their conversation with 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 Peter Music. Does anybody have any questions you want to put in the Q&A? It looks like not. So Jim, um, there were some questions that flowed by the chat. I'll, I'll try to pick those out a little bit later for you, Jim. It's, uh, been, it was a very nice chat, so I hope that uh, I'll, I'll save that so that we, we get it for you for the future. A lot of nice comments there about, about your talk. Great, thank you. So thank you very much, Jim, that was great. Um, and uh, a round of virtual applause uh, for everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. Job well people, done. People stayed till the end. That was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You had a high about 147, 148, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was incredible. So, lot, that lot may be really, that. Lots of really great comments floating, floating by. I was kind of watching some, some of that. It was incredible. Thank you very much for doing that, Jim. We really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. I'm going to end oh. show. Thanks very much, Jim. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so those who are in the cloakroom class, please stay on. Um, please stay on for uh, just a few minutes. I'm going to elevate, uh, promote Peter, use okay. the panelists. I'm going to stop the recording here. All right. I'm